is the Great Song Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, as promised, we are here with Dave Haywood of Lady A. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today on the Great Song Podcast. Ah, thank you for having me. I'm a fan. I love following you guys, and um, I've learned a lot listening to some of your episodes oh, on some of my on favorite now. songs. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Y'all have old, taught me no. some things, so that, that's, that's my new, awesome. That's my new ringback tone yeah. now. Thanks <laughs> for that. Bad. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 nice to meet you guys. Nice Man, to meet you guys. Same here. It's it's going to be a real treat uh, talking to you, and I know our listeners are going to be like, this is one of those, honestly, this is one of those conversations where I feel like certain um, certain things, when you say to people, you know, we're talking to X person, it just sort of bumps your whole cachet up a notch. Um, and and I think this is one of those. That yeah. When I go, oh. you know, we're, we're talking to the dude from Lady A, uh, they go, say what now? You're t- who now? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, you know, so, uh, so. Well, that's the first time I've heard that before. So thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we really appreciate it. Uh, why don't we start kind of at the beginning of the Lady A story, um, and I've heard you tell this story, but for the sake of our audience, uh, could you kind of tell us how Lady A came together? Any story that involves sure. MySpace, I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, MySpace will totally date us uh, for any of the listeners. Yeah, so um, I'm from Augusta, Georgia, uh, born and raised there. Um, my bandmate, Charles Kelly, uh, born and raised in Augusta as well. We both went to University of Georgia. Go dogs. Okay. Um, We're, and, we uh, both gra- bleed orange, so my, I'm, I'm sorry. Ah, I'm a huge Vols fan. This has been great, Dave. Thanks for hanging out with us. uh, (laughs) I'm sorry, guys. I lost signal. I lost you. (laughs) Let's send Um, him out with Rocky Top, everybody. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) If that's what you have in the background, I love it. Um, But uh, yeah, so we, uh, and we do love love college football. Oh, my goodness. But um, yeah, so we uh, graduated from Georgia and uh, moved to Nashville. Um, It's kind of the shorter version. We could, I could do a much longer. Shorter version is um, Charles's older brother, Josh Kelly, um, a great artist, songwriter, producer in his own right, uh, really invited Charles and I to come up to Nashville. Um, I grew up playing music, and Charles and I started writing a couple songs my senior year at Georgia. Um, and so, yeah, we um, we decided to go up to Nashville and just chase the dream. I quit my accounting job, and Charles quit his finance job and moved to Nashville, and Josh let us stay at his house for free because we didn't have any money whatsoever. <laughs> Um, and we just started writing songs and a couple months into writing songs, we were out at a bar and Charles ran in and met Hillary. Uh, Hillary Scott is born and raised in Nashville and he invited her over and said, Hey, I'm writing with my buddy Dave, uh, from Augusta. And, uh, we're just kind of writing songs thinking we can pitch songs and maybe just be songwriters. And if you want to come write with us, we'd love to, to write with you. And so when she walked in the very first day, um, I just remember being blown away by her talent. Um, and her heart, her heart, uh, and I, and I still am to this day, honestly. So yeah, I mean, we started writing and our first song was a song called all we'd ever need. And then we wrote a couple songs, one called love don't live here. Um, and a couple other songs that ended up really putting together what ended up being our first, um, album, but we had no idea. We didn't think anything about doing a band. Um, that sort of came months and months and months later after writing a bunch of songs together. So well, jo- Josh Kelly's good deed was uh, returned to him as he got to marry Catherine Heigl. So there you go. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, man. He's such a great guy. I mean, please check out Josh's music. He's still doing a lot of stuff now. But he had a big hit song called Amazing, which was huge on pop radio in the early 2000s. Um, and he got to open up on a lot of big tours. So he he was probably my biggest musical sort of um, mentor uh when we moved to Nashville, he taught me how to use Pro Tools, which is the recording software. Mm-hmm. Um, taught me how to really kind of just hone my craft of songwriting and production. Um, and so, a lot of our early demos, I was working in Pro Tools doing all of our demos, and and Josh really was the one that that taught me all of that. And and we learned and wrote a lot with Josh as well too. So great guy. And so when you when you said uh, you know you left your accounting job. And uh, Charles uh, left a, left a job in finance. To me, I, I guess because of my personality type, that to me went, oh man, that's terrifying. Because uh, those are, <laughs> you know, fairly stable uh, professions, right? With some like potential for a good solid career in accounting and in, and in finance, you know? Um, right. So that really sent a shudder down my spine when you said that. Did you guys, uh, it, it, like making that dive, that, okay, we're going to chase this dream going to Nashville. Did that terrify you guys? Or was it like, okay, here's an adventure. Let's go Frodo. If I take one more step out of the Shire, (laughs) it's the furthest I've ever been. Yeah, totally. A little bit of both, Uh, a little bit of both. And that's a great question. I remember my, all my parents said was, we're going to pray for you. 
Uh, <laughs> that's all I got from my mom and dad. But um, no, they, yeah, they y'all were could send me a check but, too. I mean, I, you know, you could, <laughs> yeah. you, could, you could pray yeah. while you close that envelope and lick it up, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was working in Buckhead, uh, north of Atlanta, uh, suit and tie kind of job, accounting job. And I mean, I enjoyed the people I worked with. Man, I just, it was not the vibe for me. The work was just not fulfilling. Um, and I always loved music. I love the creative part of music. I'd say more than anything. I mean, if you went through my voice memos in my phone, there's just a thousand voice memos of guitar progressions, piano hooks and vocal melodies and lyric ideas. So I love the creative process and Charles does too. And he's so good writing music, singing, coming up with melodies, coming up with lyrics. Um, and we just kind of kept talking and said, Hey, like, man, are you, how are you doing up there with your job? I'm like, man, I'm not fulfilled. I'm not, I'm just, I'd love to try anything. Let's just give it a shot. What if we just went to Nashville and just slept on somebody's couch and tried it? Um, and so literally, I mean, I cashed in my 401k, which is a terrible tax idea. Um, uh, you know, after having a 401k for two years, it's really not the time to cash that thing in and, uh, ended up losing half of it, but I had a couple thousand dollars to go to Nashville and lost that in the first few months of eating eating out and going to Starbucks. Right. And uh and then we were just writing songs every day, but yeah, it was it, it was a bit scary, but it was also, you know, I'm 20 I was 23 years old. And so the excitement, the adventure, I was single, you know, going to a new town, a new place. I mean, Nashville is just I mean, it felt like a mythical place. I had never visited Nashville before I moved there. Man. Um, I really just like, you know, you hear the stories of the Grand Old Opry and country music and rock music and all these things that are happening in Nashville. And I was just like, man, I love when I hear a song on the radio, I hear the production, I hear the guitars, I hear the way that that song is crafted and orchestrated. I just want to be in that world in that space with those creatives. And so I said, I'll do anything. If I have to mop floors at some publishing house or studio, I'll just do it so I can try to do music, be in the music industry and be surrounded by all those creatives. So yeah, it was, it was a bit of a thrill, but, but you know, there's definitely some, some worries as well. Well, I'm sure uh, Protivity hated to lose you there as their accountant, but the <laughs> but, but the Nashville music world and uh, is very thankful uh, to have you. You did your homework on my accounting firm. Uh, <laughs> you did, that's, that's where I worked. You, yeah. you did your homework. But, but yeah, I, I worked at a big accounting firm called Protivity and uh, got to travel around the world and do a lot of cool things. But man, writing music and recording music is where my heart is, you know? Well, you're fantastic at it. Now, I know early in the in the early days, you were booking gigs and creating the website. Was that something <laughs> that you voluntarily said, "I got this," or were they like, "Hey, Dave, you're yeah. you're running with this, uh, David Wesley. Put this on your back and go." <laughs> well, um, man, I love that you guys. Gosh, you know your stuff. I feel uh, I feel honored and a bit scared. Um, <laughs> we're gonna give out your address in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, social, yeah, yeah, please. Social please, security please. number <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'm so sorry I didn't get to the MySpace thing earlier. So yeah, I was basically, so to get really nerdy for you for a second, just please to rewind. Do. That's where we live. Okay, good, good. So at Georgia, I was basically a um, IT major. So information technology, so computer programming, things like that. So I knew how to do computer programming and to build websites and stuff. And so uh, when we got to Nashville, I, I, automatically, I was like, well, hey, we, we should, you know, we started a band um, and we needed to put together some materials. I was like, well, hey, I'll create our web page. I know how to do some of the programming. Um, and so the first thing we created was a MySpace page. Um, and even extra nerdy level was I could actually go into the MySpace page and like program the skins and program the back end oh, yeah. kind of so, oh, nice. to make it look kind of cool. I don't know if you remember that. Like yeah. people had different designs for their MySpace page. Yeah. Um, this is when all of the teenagers have deleted the podcast. They're like, what's happening here? <laughs> That's right. But um, yeah, so I helped create our website. And really, I got on the horn trying to book us shows. We would go a couple places we played early on. Well, we played at 3rd and Lindsley in Nashville, Tennessee, a ton. Um, and the owner, Ron, who is still there uh, to this day, is just one of my dear friends. And has ha he had us playing every couple weeks, you know, at like the six six o'clock slot, which is like a terrible slot. But <laughs> it's all we it's all we could get because we didn't have any following other than a couple MySpace followers. And uh, so I started trying to book shows, and we booked a couple up at um, Joe's Bar in Chicago through the owner Ed Warm. He was a guy that still runs a great um, kind of honky tonk up there in Chicago. And he had us opening up for like Shadaisy, opening up for Emerson Drive, opening opening up for Chris Cagle, a lot of these um, country artists in the early 2000s. 
And uh, yeah, I would act like we were really big and successful. I'd be like, hey, I'm <laughs> managing this new band and we would love to come open, you know, and really we just, it was just me trying to get gigs. And so we got a couple gigs and I was trying to pet play tour manager and, and band member and producer and writer and all that at the same time and, and coder computer programmer, <laughs> man, that's fantastic. I love that. That's, that's, that's a level of, of dorkiness that I can really mm. uh, appreciate. I and at the third and Lindsley thing too bad. Most of the followers probably weren't old enough to get into third and Lindsley to see you. perform. I know, <laughs> I know, I know, but man, those times were so fun. That's, it's a really cool, small songwriter bar if you haven't been there and it's a great place to showcase new artists and uh, you know, play your own material. I mean, Broadway is for playing covers and playing old country songs and, you know, kind of having a party. There's a couple bars off Broadway, like Third and Lindsley, that are more for writing your own music and performing your own music. So, man, that place was a home for us. And Charles and Hillary and I just loved being up on that stage. And, and yeah, I mean, we had five people the first time. We were opening <laughs> for Josh Kelly, uh, maybe 10 the next time. And it probably grew by five or 10 every gig. And, and you know, we had 150 people at the end of it, which was massive for us. And a couple big record label people had heard about it, and Mike Dungan from Capitol Records was at one of those shows and uh, basically offered us a record deal backstage. He's like, I love what wow. you're doing. I love the harmonies, the vocal blend, the male and female leads. It's just a unique thing. I'd love to sign you guys. And so that was kind of our story back in 2006. Well, it's I, I mean, it, it's one of those things where listening to what you guys have, it's, you know, it it feels like it was bound to happen. I know that's never a safe thing to say, but, you know, just oh, it's you. undeniable what you guys have together. You hear it instantly. So it's no surprise that, you know, record exec showed up and went, yeah, we need, you know, we need this uh Need this now, uh, pun oh, totally intended. Hey, ooh, I like that. Um, that's a good play. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you talked about your harmony, and that's one of the things that really jumps off the page with you guys. Are there harmony groups in particular that you guys looked at either as inspirational um, or, you know, that just um, that you guys go, that's it. That's kind of the thing that we're going for, seminal, you know, for the band. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of it for me, I grew up, uh, my dad taught me how to play guitar. He's a great guitar and banjo player. Um, my mom sings too, and we listen to a lot of Christian music, a lot of gospel music, okay. um, playing at church, a lot of hymns. So there's, there's, to me, there's kind of the foundation of, um, you know, some of those great melodies and harmonies in, in, in the hymnal books and all the great music at church. Um, you know, more contemporary pop stuff. I mean, that I was listening to was a ton of Eagles. Um, I'd, ca I'd have to put Eagles and Fleetwood Mac in the kind of one and two categories okay. for me. Yeah. Um, you know, being a, and having multiple lead singers and just different things that you're sort of interested in. I mean, you know, like as an Eagles fan, like Timothy B. Schmidt, when he sings, like that's some of my favorite songs and some of my favorite harmonies and vocal texture that he provides. And um, so I love diving into the multiple members of Eagles and Fleetwood Mac. Um, and so I think we were trying to really emulate some of those harmonies. I mean, obviously, like Mamas and Papas, uh, things like that. Uh, just real full harmony. I, I love the feel and the sound of family harmony. Um, and there's just, yeah, I mean, the, something started to kind of form when even that first day we wrote a song, um, thinking me, we might just write music for Hillary at the beginning because she had sort of a solo record deal. Um, we were like, well, let's just write songs for this. But once we started all kind of singing three-part harmony, it really sort of took on its own life and it felt like something unique um, when we were all kind of blending together. But yeah, a lot of the classic rock, 70s, um, 80s stuff. Uh, I mean, I love guitar players like James Taylor. Um, and I mean, gosh, it just kind of, it, it goes on and on down that world. And then, we, and then like nineties rock, we all had like a nineties rock band, me and Charles. So, you know, we were all like playing the Pearl Jam and Dave Matthews and stuff yeah. as well. Nothing wrong with that. Well, props on not saying the Eagles. That's like right. you get a boat. Nice job going Eagles. You'll be <laughs> you, surprised. <laughs> we you almost <laughs> pitched a perfect game there. You, you did it. You did it. It was wonderful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh well, I, I, I am I am a big fan. I mean, I yeah. gosh, I just, oh, the harmonies just and the stuff they wrote and the chord progressions as a guitar player, it is just heaven as a guitar player as well. So it's a it's a running joke for us that whenever on the podcast, if we say the Eagles, then we bleep it out like we swore or something <laughs> like that. So uh, so the one time that you did say the don't don't be surprised when you hear it. Uh, <laughs> Censor. That's just a, we grew, I love that. We grew up in church too, so we're not editing out a. Uh, it robs a music worship leader yeah. at a church. Nice. And, and I play guitar in church, so, it's yeah, like, so we keep it oh, clean. That's awesome. No yeah, theme. I grew. I grew up playing in church. Yeah, I grew up playing in church in a lot of worship bands in high school uh, and in college as well at UGA. So, um, man, I grew up. I grew up playing a lot of my guitar chords. For me personally, a lot of my guitar chords and formations come from a lot of 
sort of open E uh, Christian music that that I really loved and fell in love with too. So yeah, I mean that's a that's an influence on my guitar playing a lot too. I'll tell you something that you do that is awesome. This song is an E, the one we're talking about. Uh, your video where you show how you play it is on YouTube, for those, oh, which yeah. is so cool that you uh, you went and I know you play Capo Four NC, but that's so neat that you took the time to actually show people how to play the song the way you play it, which I don't see that much. That's awesome. Well, thank you, JP. I um, you know, I grew up just such a fan of, of those bands we were talking about, Eagles, uh, <laughs> and many other bands. And I, I always was like, man, I just wish I could figure out, I would sit there with my guitar listening to the radio, trying to figure out how they did it. Um, even up into like Dave Matthews' acoustic playing and John Mayer's acoustic playing. I mean, some of that stuff I have just tried to just analyze to get their chord formations because they sound so full. And so for me as a fan of other artists, I was like, man, I just wish I could see what they were doing in the studio. And so I was like, you know what? Let me just let the fans in on that. I've done that for a couple of our songs. Um, you know, my guitar playing is not like super expert through the roof prolific, but but my acoustic, I love creating cool, full sounding acoustic chords, things that feel really full bodied and that you could fill an arena with and feel a, fill a room with. So yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, good luck learning how to play neon just by listening. Right? <laughs> I <laughs> know. I, I used a ha- I used a pedal that slows it down in half back when <laughs> I was in high school, and so I, I I put that thing in half time where it was like bow 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 bow. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out how to play that thing. Such a weird, such a weird riff. Um, yeah. So initially, you know, you moved to Nashville. You and Charles moved to Nashville, and you hook up with with um, Hillary, and you, and you form this thing that becomes Lady A. But initially, as a songwriter, you know, you're trying to write things for the band that are good enough to make the album and be the singles. You're trying to write for other artists, you know, stuff that's good enough to make their albums and be singles. But then, as an artist, you reach a spot where people are dying to get something of theirs in your hands. You know, if I could just get this song in front of Lady A, what's that mm. transition like? How do you guys handle it, you know, taking submissions or, or even outside co-writing opportunities for Lady A? Man, that's an uh, excellent question. I've never had that question. I mean, our first album was pretty much all material that, that we wrote. Um, there was one song, I believe that was an outside song, but early on in our career, we, we signed a publishing deal with Warner Chapel. Um, and so they were kind of in charge of our publishing, trying to pitch a couple songs that we didn't write to other artists as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, people, after our first record, um, you know, and again, the very first record that people say you have your life to make it. I mean, we, we had, you know, a year and a half cause we had just met each other and right. it was all new material we were writing, uh, at that point in time. So the, the first record was really just completely all stuff. Are that we wrote, the three of us, maybe with a couple more extra writers like Victoria Shaw um, and a couple other folks, uh, Tom Douglas, stuff like that. But I mean, Love Don't Live Here is like straight up the three of us. That was just like our pure heart, who we are as Lady A. So, but yeah, once we got to our second record, as we were putting that together, the Need You Now album, you know, songs like I would say American Honey is a really good example. We did not write American Honey. And that one came through and just had a authentic and organic feel to it. And so, yeah, I mean, when, when when it's a great song, it's a great song. I mean, I think, you know, the James Taylor, Carol King kind of world of like the way they would write songs for each other and had so many outside cuts too. I mean, if it's a great song, just forget who wrote it. Let's just cut it, record it and get it out there. And, and, and American Honey was one of those that comes to mind from that record. And, you know, at, at that point in time, you feel some ownership in wanting to write everything. But at the end of the day, if it's a story you feel like you can put your name on and put your stamp on and put yourself in that place. I mean, I I wish I would have written American Honey. That was a Hillary Lindsay song with some other writers. And it it just felt like such a sort of Georgia nostalgic growing up in a sense kind of thing that that we wanted to represent and say and and sing. So that that, that one stands out for me in that in that. It's funny that you mentioned American Honey because I'm a Carrie Barlow fan because I grew up listening to Luna Halo. I don't know if you yes. know who they are. Oh his other, I know exactly Luna who they are. I was like, holy cow, I can't believe he picked that one out of all the list because like, I follow Carrie Barlow cause, and he's written some some monsters. So that's yeah, so I've neat. forgotten about Luna Halo. They're, they're, uh, yeah, Luna Halo. Yeah, so we were right. So we were playing Third and Lindsay a lot around that time. Uh, Jeremy Lister and like Luna Halo and like some of these bands and stuff. Um, Safety Suit was yeah, this rock band. Yeah, goodness oh, wow. gracious. Um, and oh. they were like, we were playing the same kind of bars at the same time as them and um, yeah, man, I, I, all those great memories of us kind of coming up, I feel like, around the same time in Nashville. Yeah. 
Well, you definitely uh, – there's parts of these interviews where we just blast on things that we love, like – and I could do this with you guys forever because you got hits like, you know, I Run to You, Need You Now, We on the Night, Long Stretch of Love, all which you were part co-write on. But I think my favorite video from you guys is Looking for a Good Time. I think it's hysterical <laughs> when the mechanic puts his hand on your suit. Now, do you play the solo live? You play it on the video. Do you play the guitar solo live? I, I play it live. So, yeah, on our records, um, I mean, we've had some fantastic electric players. Paul Worley, our producer for our first, gosh, five, six, seven records, Paul Worley played that guitar solo on the album okay. for Looking oh. for a Good Time. Okay. Um, and I play it live. That one's a simpler solo I, I can pull off. I'm not a profi- like totally like expert level electric player. Uh, but I can pull off oh, some you of got the solos good chops. live. Yeah, you got well, you know, I'm kind of right there in that <laughs> middle average tier. But um, I leave the really expert stuff to our backing band guys. We have a guy named Slim and a guy named Clint, and they are like, oh my god, just shredders. So I let them kind of take those real, <laughs> the real big ones. But that one's funny. Yeah, I played that one live um, to this day, and you know, it's funny you brought that song up, JP, because I still have moments where I'm like, did people like that one? Because absolutely, I, that's the one. It, it felt really fun at the time, but when we play it today, I'm like, do people still like it? But every night when we get out there and I'm like, na 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 I mean, it's literally like G to C. It's like two chords. And, you know, it's one of those songs, like from a guitar standpoint, I'm like, this is so basic, but I know people <laughs> love the feel of it. Because and, they um, can say, hey, I covered this song. Right? Like, I covered yeah. this one. My band covers this Lady A song because anybody <laughs> – because it's playable. So yeah. it's good. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, man. And, and yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I on, on our records, um, I dig in really deep in the acoustic guitar and mandolin world. Um, but it's a fun process. We had so many great years with Paul Worley. And, I mean, I could talk for days about his process, and maybe we'll get to that too. But it's it really just an honor to work with so many great – instrumentalist in nashville i have one follow-up video question and then i'll, I'll kick uh, the the you look good video which was recorded in puerto rico is pretty cool what's your favorite video shoot location like someplace that you were like this was fun obviously the the puerto rico one looks fun and the you look good but what what is your favorite location that you've got to go to <sighs> man that's a great great question gosh y'all have good questions really right, good thanks. questions oh, thanks we do our and best I lo- uh thank you well and you know i um Gosh, I think this is my third podcast of my my career. I haven't done many podcasts, so <laughs> oh, you're doing fantastic. It's really, uh, well, it's really fun to do the long form thing where you guys just give a chance to really just dig in and talk about stuff. Most of the stuff we do in radio is like sixty seconds. Here they are, right. and you just don't have a chance to to really walk through the nuance of it. So thanks for thanks for giving a platform for that. I mean, I I really enjoyed that video in Puerto Rico. Um, that would probably be the most fun because we got to go down there for like two or, two or three days. Normally you shoot in Nashville, either in like a sound stage, mm-hmm. um, like the, you look good video, uh, excuse me, you look good looking for a good time. Very yeah. similar title. Um, looking for a good time back in like Oh seven Oh eight. Um, we just shot in Nashville and it was kind of the old Ed Sullivan show throwback, yep. um, kind of wardrobe and stuff. So that was like on a sound stage. Um, and like, you know, we own the night. I love that video a lot. It was just downtown Nashville, but we were like on this rooftop down by the river in Nashville. Um, bartender was a really fun one. We shot that out in Los Angeles. Um, and oh, you know what, you know what I'll tell you? I think the most fun was probably downtown. Charles and I were dressed up as police officers and Hillary was like bashing in our car. That's cool. Um, (laughs) And it was just a fun day. Beth bears, uh, the actress was in that video as well. And so she was hilarious and she was on set all day and we were laughing, getting to know her, but, um, downtown might be the most fun. Puerto Rico has to be the the best location for, for you look good though. I love, love being down there. It was really cool. Excellent. Tell us a little bit about your experience on Songland. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this. You guys were in the, the season two, uh, premiere of Songland. Um, what it's, it, first of all, brilliant idea, the concept of that show as somebody who loves music and loves songwriting, you know, it's just brilliant on every side. And it seems to be like a really well thought out idea from the, from the artist side coming in. What was it like? Well, it was an automatic yes when we first heard about it. I watched all of season one, and when the show came out, I mean, I knew Shane McAnally was on it because we've written with him, and I followed him online, and so he was talking about it leading up to it. So um, I was pretty well aware of the show coming out, but once it aired, I watched all of season one. I mean, the Macklemore episode was one of my favorites. Um, I just thought it was such a great look behind the curtain of songwriting, and and the reason I love it is – Songwriting to this day may be the most challenging thing to sort of explain and kind of 
to- like people, that's kind of the biggest question. Like, how do you write a song? Like, what are you doing? Like, what do you start with? Where does the idea come from? And so it at least gave an insight into a little bit of that process of hearing a song when it's sort of written and it can be changed. You can rework the lyrics and and work with it and, and the way that you kind of work on a song. I know the writers walk in on Songland with a finished product, but, you know, Ryan Tedder, Esther Dean, and, and Shane McAnally take it, rework it, and often change some of the things. So I, I like that it at least gives um, fans a way to see a bit behind the scenes. I love behind the, th- the scenes stuff. I mean, if if I could be a fly on the wall to see how they wrote some of those songs in the 60s and 70s, oh my gosh, what I, what I would give to, give to see, you know, the writing session behind like Zeppelin songs or anything like that. So <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really neat process. Um, and so we were on the show and I think we went in just kind of with an open mind. I didn't know if we would get a particular song we would really use a lot out of it, if, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't know if it, we would really get something that would be like a tried and true something in the Lady A catalog. Um, but, you know, we shot it January, right before the pandemic. And um, we had, so the song Champagne Night, it came in as a different song. And the feel felt like, like total, like Lady A, Hillary got some sass, got some fun, got some party, live amphitheater kind of feel. And we were like, man, this feels like a Lady A jam. You could open up a show with this or close a show with this. And so we worked on it and Shane McAnally helped tweak some of the lyrics. Um, And we all pitched in a little bit, but really it was Madeline Merlot, the songwriter that had that song, uh, Champagne Night. And so it felt like a jammer and we wanted to put it out as a single because we were like, we got a big tour coming. Uh, let's get it out there for a big summer jam. And sure enough, the pandemic hit and we obviously had to pivot and cancel the tour. But I think the song still was such a fun one to have a fun one to kind of listen to and enjoy. And it, I think it's going to be one of those staples when we head back out on the road, hopefully at the end of this year or later this year, um, you know, I think it will be one of those songs you can open a show with or, or close a show with. So it feels like a really fun one. I mean, we have some fun songs that give Hillary kind of a front and center moment, like Downtown and Bartender. Um, and I love I love when she can kind of get sassy and have a good time. And so <laughs> Champagne Night's one of those as well. You could see, you know, watching the episode, you could see in everybody's body language that that was going to be the one. It, that's what it looked like to me. Yeah. Now, now I, you know, I, I knew it going in that that was going to be the one. So maybe I read that into it, but I remember this story about Michael Jackson being in the studio during the, during the bad sessions. Um, Mm. and they were trying to decide between two songs to make the album. Uh, it was, and it was between, uh, street walking and, um, Oh gosh, what's it called? Another part of me, just, you know, just, Uh, and Michael wanted street walking. Um, but his, um, his agent, I got or manager, Frank DeLeo was in the room and Quincy was in the room and they started playing the groove to just another part of me and everybody's body mm. language started changing. They started moving. People started getting up and dancing and they went, that's the one, right? Because yeah. it, it, any song that does that to people upon first listen, you go, this is, this is it. It doesn't, you know yeah. what I mean? And it's such a, it's a, it's a well-written song. It's a great song to begin with. And then it has the added benefit of it just sort of elevates the energy in the room. Uh, you know, for the listeners. And so I agree. I think once you guys are getting yeah. back out on back out on the road, you will have those t-shirts that say doubles and bubbles. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's, I, I think that's going to be a great, a great vibe. Thank you, man. I, I totally agree. It's a really fun one. And you know, a lot of people know us for some of the, you know, the big duets or ballads. I mean, need you now just to kiss and dancing with my heart songs like that. So to have a couple extra in the, in the can for the road, for the tour, I mean, I just, oh, I miss it so much talking about it. But, man, playing those amphitheaters in the summertime is just so much fun in the country music world. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, that song, it kind of goes right hand in hand with those kind of shows, yeah. So you threw out ballad, so I got to go ballad question here. Big Love in a Small Town I, is the ballad oh. that I pick of yours. Thunderbirds and Pontiac Wild. Do you, what was your first car? First car. Oh, yeah. My, my first car was not as sexy as a Thunderbird. I had a Honda <laughs> Civic. Yeah, I had a Honda Civic that cost like thirty six hundred dollars. Well we done. Yeah. That's counted <laughs> mind already That's at a young right. age. Very <laughs> practical. Already thinking, thinking financially. Man, I love that you love that song. I mean, what a hidden gem. I think there were some really hidden gems on that Heartbreak um, album. Uh, oh my goodness! Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, Big Love in a Small Town, and and man, we wrote wrote that um with nicole galleon and jordan reynolds and jordan reynolds is doing a lot with dan and shay and um he he does ballads so well and nicole does lyrics so well it was a great team but man i I miss uh bringing up that record too. our producer busby that we lost a couple years ago man he was such a huge part of our career um and that record 
I just it's hard for me to hear anything about that record and those songs without just being back at his house, sitting back in his studio, working with him for hours and hours and learning from him and and just the incredible influence he had on us. So um, I miss him dearly. But man, that song. Yeah, I mean, I, I love ballads. Selfishly, I would put out an album of all ballads. <laughs> I, I just love them. I love I mean. I grew up just wearing out, I mean, the dance by Garth Brooks yeah. oh, man, and just yeah. all kinds of just timeless uh, Alison Krauss ballads. Um, well, I mean, sell, really, when, you'd sell at least two copies to yeah, me and Rob. Right. So we're in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> just what turn it on and it get about, all in our feels. <laughs> I know. What is it about ballads? I mean, like the new Ingrid Andrus record that I love her music. She's a country, country female artist and man does ballads so well. And I just eat it up. It's the emotion, the, the, lyrics it just all hits just right so yeah i mean selfishly i think everyone in lady a charles and hillary and i we like we're obsessed with the ballads but obviously you got to have the fun ones let's you know let's get, get some out there that people can enjoy for the shows and and bop their heads to as well so yeah i, I i'm really loving um you know your your conversations about writing and i'm and i'm just a i'm a i'm a uh, you know i'm a hack writer myself and so i i try and uh you know take in everything I can, but I, everybody talks about, <clears throat> um, the, um, you know, people like to ask the question, what's the one piece of advice you would give an aspiring songwriter moving to Nashville or an artist trying to break in? Um, I want to know what's the worst advice of that kind <laughs> that you ever oh, got. Gosh. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. <laughs> and name names. No, don't. No, really. yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Gosh, I've had so many bad songs, too. I don't know if I'm one to give much advice. You know, I will say the best advice is just to keep working at it because quantity-wise, like, you'd be surprised how many songs we you don't hear of, of Lady A or of any artist. I mean, for that first album, that our, our, our first debut album, I mean, we, we probably had 80 to 100 songs we had oh, written. God. Goodness gracious. Um, and and you're only getting to hear about ten of those on the album. So I I, I wish I could say that. I mean, I, I, the best advice is really to st- stay at it. Our advice was to try to write a song every day. Um, gosh, bad advice. I'm trying to think <laughs> if I had any bad advice. Um, I mean, I don't know. I've I, I've I don't know. But I mean, stick it, sticking with it and trying to just keep writing and honing your craft. Um, trying to, I mean, we tried to commit to writing one song every day, uh, when we moved to Nashville and, you know, it, it, you took a lot of bad songs. I mean, there's just really, really some bad songs that like don't make any sense and none of the lyrics tie together and none of the melodies really repeat, you know? Um, but yeah, after a while you kind of sort of hone your craft a little bit and sort of understand kind of what, you know, what we do as a trio and what we wanted to put out there. So, but man, yeah, we, we will never make an album of the 90 songs that you don't want to hear from the, <laughs> from the record. What's your, if you're in a, if you're in a co-write situation, uh, what's your method for telling somebody in a nice way, dude, that chorus sucks. Uh, <laughs> like, Cause you're like the nicest guy. Yeah. We're like, give us some, uh, some worst advice. You're like, oh, I don't have anything. You're just yeah. so positive. Yeah. My, I think my go-to phrase is, um, you know, nobody's doing that right now. <laughs> you know, nobody's doing that. Yes. That's yeah. it. Oh, that's the line. Oh, like I if it's it. like a, you know, you, you, someone plays like a really weird off the wall chord that feels terrible. I'm, you know, nobody's really doing that right now. Now, now wait you know? a minute. He started this with, Hey, I like what you guys are doing. Nobody's really doing this right now. <laughs> Subtly. He's like, now wait a minute. Are you? That's fine. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I, I may be. I'm guilty of being passive aggressive. That's just my personality. That's type. awesome. But, yeah, that's wonderful. How do you know when you're in a session? How, how do you make that decision? I need to speak up about this, or or I wonder if I let this go, if it'll fix itself eventually. Surely they'll realize this is terrible. Man, there's a great. I feel so lucky, and I'm not. This is not just a um, you know, kind of kissing up kind of comment. I am so lucky that. The vibe that we share, the mutual respect I share for Charles and Hillary and I, I mean, we have this incredible working relationship where the three of us all bring different strengths uh, to the table, different perspectives, but it just works. I mean, that we all really, at the end of the day, love the same kind of music. I mean, look, let's call it what it is. I don't think we would have been able to survive as a band 15 plus years if we didn't absolutely love each other, respect what each other does, brings to the table um, so there's a great mutual respect. And so we really value each other in that, in that space. If you're in the studio and I hear Charles going, ah, I just, I, it's, I don't, it's, I don't like that. It's not my thing. I'm like, I totally get that. You know, let's move on from it. Let's try something different. And same with Hillary uh, from a writing standpoint, from a production standpoint in the studio. So I think there's a real beautiful kind of thing happening in our relationship where we, it's a give and take. 
um, and, and me as well too. They trust me a lot in the studio because that's really where my my kind of heart and my head lives. Is really, I mean, I have a basement studio which is where I am right now talking to you guys, and and I got all. I love playing with my gear and recording and messing around with all my software and coming up with ideas all day long. So that's really my happy place too. So we all kind of trust each other in different spaces, but I mean, it's just a risk. It comes from a respect for each other. It comes from a love from what each other brings to the table where it makes it actually kind of easy. We really don't have those sort of like blow ups. Like I'm leaving unless the drum part changes. I mean, we really don't, (laughs) We really don't have any anything like that in our band uh, whatsoever. So we feel pretty lucky. We feel really lucky with that. Well, I got a respect and a relationship tie-in. So you got married April 14th, 2012. So we'll talk yes. relationship here. I got married April 11th, 2012. And oh, nice. Our date was actually April 14th, but my wife always <laughs> wanted to get married on a Wednesday. So we got weird. We were torn between those two dates. So being as oh I, I'm the veteran in this uh, relationship thing, <laughs> I, I got you by three days. I'm just kidding, but... <laughs> Uh, What's it like? Tell me what married life is really like. I'm just kidding. But um, also, friend of the show, Dave Barnes, sang at your wedding. So He did. He pretty- did. And he is... Oh, he's such a dear friend. Yeah, thank you, JP. And yes, congrats on um, what are we at now? I guess uh, we're at eight. We're coming years. up, coming up on number nine and two. Yeah, coming uh, up on well, nine. Depending on where right. we release this, yeah. So don't uh, maybe, t- maybe we. Yeah, maybe we should do like a joint anniversary. Let's do uh, it. Oh party together. Yeah, I would. But, uh, um, I would definitely up my clout if uh, if uh, the four of us hung out. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Dave Barnes sang at my wedding. So um, my wife uh, in Nashville before we were engaged and married, she was really good friends with Dave's wife Annie Barnes. Um, and so when we got engaged, we got to know the Barneses pretty well. And I was actually a real big fan of Dave's and I told him that a couple times and probably creeped him out, but <laughs> I really, I really, man, wore out his records. The production that Ed Cash put together on his records and the songs he was writing. I mean, it, it's incredible music. Um, and I've always loved what he did and got to know him and he was way funnier and kinder in person. He's been such a great dear friend over the years and we actually stay in touch. Um, probably week to week, uh, kind of checking on each other, but yeah, he sang at our wedding. He, um, he did God gave me you at our wedding. Um, and Annie Barnes was in our wedding and we had a string section playing along to Dave and singing God gave me you at this outdoor wedding outside of Nashville, um, on a beautiful, beautiful day in April. So yeah, it's, it was a really, really sweet time. And, um, man, just a special, special friend there. That's so cool. Really but- went for the low hanging fruit there with God gave me you. <laughs> <laughs> Dug deep in the deep cut uh, there. That's got yeah. me, that immediately, though, got me thinking about if I could have one person sing a song that they wrote at my wedding, who would oh, it have man, been? That's, that's, a, gonna be that's a sidebar for when, another day. Yeah, when that's we hang one. up, that's I'm going to start writing that's down a, some ideas on that. Yeah, one, there you go. Well, Dave, you've been, you've been great. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. There is one question that we ask everybody that comes on, so and then we'll let you enjoy your day. But you're on tour either uh, with Lady A or Flying Solo, whatever you're doing. You go into a gas station. What is your gas station snack food of choice? And while you're thinking of it, I'll tell you mine. Um, I get a Three Musketeers bar. When I was growing up, my mom said you could have any candy bar you want. That's the most ounces uh, of any candy bar. Mm. So I would get a Three Musketeers. What is your gas station snack food of choice? Well, don't sleep on sunflower seeds now. Okay. Okay. Those, yeah. There you go. Those, for the for the time, for the money, for the time you're going to put into that sunflower seed bag, I mean, you're, you're going to be working on that bag for the next six hours driving down to Florida yeah. for your vacation. So get you a big old bag of David's sunflower seeds and maybe something sweet like some Sour Patch Kids to kind of top it off. But that would probably be my go-to. Well, I grew That's- up playing baseball, so everybody had sunflower seeds. Like, that was the thing <laughs> that they did. And uh, one of the moments I got made fun of the worst in my life, um, I just finished sliding into second, came back, and I'm filthy. And uh, I wanted some sunflower seeds. And I was like, hey, coach, I was like, just drop the bag, you know, just just drop some in my mouth. He's like, I'm not putting sunflower seeds in your mouth. He's like, you can get a little dirty in there. So uh, uh, so a good yeah, call nice. on the sunflower seeds. That's, that's another that's one. Is, that's very practical. Again, yeah, I, practical. When we go back to yeah. it. It's, Practicality, that's right. It really is. It's about the value over time, you know? <laughs> it, it they is. can last. Think about it. Eat yeah. one well, a mile. I mean, Drag it out. Yeah. You amortize those sunflower seeds. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's good. wow. Fantastic. Love it. Uh, man, thanks so much for joining us. This has been a blast. Um, and thanks to Dave Barnes, who actually, he, he you know, hooked us up uh, together. We yeah. always love him. And he's been a, a tremendous friend of the show since, uh, since he's been on with us. 
Um, and so we really appreciate this, you know, connection here. This has been so much fun, Dave. We hope you've enjoyed yourself. Uh, I know you said you've only done like three of these, but uh, hopefully you got something new out of this that uh, you may not get other places. So we've enjoyed. No, I, I mean it when I say it. I know. I know you said we're off there. So, but but yeah, seriously, dude. Like a lot of what we do is radio land. Of like, here they are. What boxers are briefs? Okay, back to <laughs> break. You know, so to to talk about the music and the videos and stuff. Thank you, man. I, it's it's it's, a, it's refreshing. It's very refreshing. So thank you. That's awesome. That made our day. You just, made our yeah, day. just made our day. I have two ringback uh, tones now that I can use. Oh, there you go. That there just made go. us. We just shared a wistful glance with each other when you said that. So, uh, that's great. Thanks, Dave. Well, we'll awesome. be in touch, yeah. man. Thank you so much. You got it, man. Nice to meet you guys. Right, same Talk here. Soon. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. All the best. Bye-bye. This is the Great Song Podcast. Yeah, buddy. Man, that was fun. Season 8, Episode 1. Dave Haywood. That's the right song to start off the season with, too. Yeah. We debate, we always debate which ones we open with and where we put some order on That's this. Right. But after discussing it, it was like, come on, this is the yeah. one. Uh, about about three weeks into the break between seasons, you guys almost got this phone call from us. You know what I mean? We were like, hey, listen, listen, <laughs> listen, we just we just need to put out a new episode so bad. <laughs> we miss you. Um, what are you doing right now? I'm drinking you know? some coffee. Are you are you with another podcast? <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's funny so uh yeah man this is a lot of fun dave haywood thanks so much for coming on uh it was it was really a lot of fun getting to talk to him and and uh, getting to hang out for a little bit so uh we hope you guys are doing well and uh season eight has officially begun the starter pistol has fired and we are off to the races oh, dude and we're you, coming to blazing yes we are i can't wait to uh get some of these episodes in your ear holes so we'll be back next week let's do it again we'll catch you next week with another great song until then i'm rob i'm jp go listen to some music